Father, we thank you for moments of stillness and quiet, such as we've had just in this moment gone by. And we pray that you would give us those moments of quiet now, throughout our, throughout our, our days, uh, when we can stop and be reminded by your spirit of your presence, of your care, that you're watching over our lives. We thank you for this opportunity that you have given us on this day, this Lord's Day, to gather, to worship you. We know that you have heard us, that you take delight in our, in our praise. You've heard these, our prayers. And now, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to hear you as you speak to us uh, through the reading of your word and our consideration of it together this day. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 If you would uh, stand for the <clears throat> reading of God's word, you can turn in your Bibles or your smartphones or your tablets, whatever mode you have. And our Old Testament reading this morning as we enter into Advent and read the, our text from the lectionary, Isaiah 60, for the first uh, nine verses. Oh, that you would render the heavens and come down, that the, mount, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to help, to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet... Oh, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are your people. And then our New Testament reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. I'm reading to the end. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, uh, with great power, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth. To the ends of the heavens. I learned this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all of these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. But I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. 
This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. (laughs) Well, it's hard to believe, but Christmas Eve is just three weeks away. I think it's safe to say that most people associate Christmas with watchfulness. Children are watching for a glimpse of reindeer in the sky, for a glimpse of Santa coming down the chimney. Uh, Children, and some of them (laughs) grown-ups, are watching the gifts as they gather under the tree, trying to guess what's in those with their names on them. Many of us will be watching for that car that will bring a family member or friends that we haven't seen for some time. But our gospel reading here today in Mark the 13th chapter also is about watchfulness, but it's a far cry from the watchfulness and expectations of popular popular imagination of of our culture. Today, on this first Sunday of Advent, Um, uh, as we gather, it is the first in a month of Sundays to prepare for Christmas. And on this first Sunday of Advent, in the tradition of the church, we are called upon to watch, to watch for the advent of Christ, the second advent, his second coming. Now, the text that we have uh, read here from Mark is actually part of a large answer to a question that has been asked by his disciples. And we see that in the first four verses of Mark, and let me read those for you. As he, that is Jesus, was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? And Jesus, here having told his disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem, which, by the way, happened in 70 A.D., about 40 years later. Jesus goes from there on to give a long answer to this question. When is it going to happen, and how do we know when it is about to happen? Now, the key and most um, perplexing and discussed uh, verse in all of Jesus' answer is in our reading in verse 30, where it says, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all of these things have happened. Now, I will tip my hand. In my own view, I think that this generation refers to the very generation to which Jesus is speaking, which did, in fact, witness the destruction of Jerusalem. After all, Jesus is answering the question about the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in about 40 years later. However, I also agree with most commentators that Jesus seems to also be pointing beyond the fall of Jerusalem and pointing to his own return. Now, there have been a lot of speculations about the second coming of Christ. Some of you may be old enough to actually remember Hal Lindsey, who wrote the best-selling book in 1970 entitled The Late Great Planet Earth. Great title. Bad theology. (laughs) Lindsay predicted that Jesus would return in the 80s. And if you are old enough like I to remember those days, you will remember the end-time fever. I can't tell you how many times we sang, I wish we'd all been ready during my college days. There was a general fear of being left behind. Of course, it was much later that I figured out that you actually do want to be left behind. Uh, There's a parallel passage in Matthew, uh, the 24th chapter, which is actually exactly the same context, 
Same question, same answers of Jesus, except that Jesus' answer is much longer. Um, and so, and the chapter begins with the same question and then goes through these answers. But notice verses 36 through 42 of Jesus' answer over in Matthew. He says, No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, away, taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. Now, I hope you notice here in this text uh, who it is that is left behind. The picture uh, here is, Jesus said it's going to be like the days of Noah, right? And so what happened on the day, what, what is it that happens here? Well, says Jesus, you remember what it was like? Uh, Noah was um, in the ark and everybody, every, everybody was marrying, drinking until the flood came and took them away. Who was left behind? Noah and his family. And that's why Paul then, or John, Jesus then continues in this day. He says, that's the way it's going to be. There's two people grinding. One is taken away. But the other is left behind, as was Noah. Right? Uh, and, and so that. So believe me, just, I'm just saying this. Believe me, you do want to be left behind. I, but I remember talks and sermons on this very text in Matthew 24 about Christians being raptured and believers uh, being left behind. People were totally enraptured with end-time fever. And Lindsay actually made quite a bit of money selling those books. You may also remember, if you're, again, as old as I am, uh, you remember a magazine called The Wittenberg Door that was edited by Mike Iaconelli. Uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the continuation of that's probably the Babylon Bee today, if you know about the Babylon Bee. Uh, then you have a good idea of uh, what the Wittenberg door was. It was a kind of a mad magazine that poked fun at evangelicals in particular. And I remember one on the very back cover of that issue, there was a picture of, of Lindsay uh, driving a Mercedes Benz into a gated mansion with the doors opening, and Lindsay is looking, Lindsay's looking over his shoulder, he's got his hands up and a face like this, he says, I guess I was wrong. Right? <laughs> and remember Harold Camping? In the early 90s, he wrote a book called 94. Fortunately, he put a question mark at the end of it. Um, he, he famously said that he was 99.9% .9 certain that Jesus would come in September of 1994. Someone who used to attend Grace brought the book to me and lent it to me. And uh, so I, um, I took it up and began reading. And on the first page, Camping said something like, Jesus said no one knows the day nor the hour, but he didn't say you couldn't know the month and the year. <laughs> and so I, at that very moment, closed the book, <laughs> took it back to the person that, who had lent it to me and gave them my review of the book. <laughs> Camping revised his calculations, you remember. Came up with a new date, a new prediction, May 21. Uh, 2011, which I thought was a little strange because he had acknowledged before that one couldn't know the day, but this time he had a day, May 21. But Jesus did not cooperate, and uh, he failed. He failed to appear. Well, you know, I could go on and on uh, with false predictions of the end time and of the second advent of Jesus. But what what are we to make? of this passage here in Mark 13. Well, the one word that Jesus gives as a command is the word watch. In fact, it's the very last word of this entire response that Jesus gives to his disciples. He says to them, watch. And there are two things that I'd like to observe about the watchfulness that Jesus gives us to do. And these points are simply this, watch by believing in Christ and his coming. And secondly, watch by working in the certainty of his 
coming. So first of all, then, watch by believing in Christ and his coming. There's a huge assumption behind the words of Jesus. And that assumption is that he is who he claimed to be. Right? I mean, here's this man, here's Jesus, a man in the first century, and he's predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and predicting that he's coming back to earth one day. And the reality is that all of this is meaningless unless he is who he claimed to be. And he claimed to be the very Son of God. He claimed to be the Savior of the world who would die on a cross and pay for the sins of all of those who would believe in him. And this claim was demonstrated as true by his resurrection from the dead, which he also said would happen. So here's Jesus pointing to a day when he would return in order to gather all of his people. 26 and 7, at that time men will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. And dear brothers and sisters and those who are visiting with us and those who may not know Jesus, there's only one way to watch with hope for the second coming of Christ. And that is that you believe in him as your savior. That he died for sin. That he lived a perfect life. That on the cross, through faith in him, you can be assured that your sins have been atoned for, that Jesus has paid for them all. And that he lived a perfect life in order that his obedience, his record of perfection, could be given to you in exchange for your sin. That he rose physically and literally from the dead and will raise you too one day. That he has brought you into the very family of God and that he will return one day to renew all things. And that at his, re at his return there will be a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. That is why God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. You see, we watch for the second advent of Christ because we believe in his first advent, the birth of the Son of God, which is what we celebrate at Christmas. Scott Hotze puts it so well. He writes, if the church cannot proclaim and look forward to the second advent of Christ, then in all honesty, there is precious little sense in making much ado about his first advent in Bethlehem. If Jesus is not coming back to make all things new and bring in the kingdom he talked about all through his ministry, then any celebration of his birth really would be on par with the fantasies about Santa Claus and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer or the generic holiday spirit with which people try to get infused every December. If Jesus is not the Lord of Lords, who can come back at the end of history, then Silent Night has all of the charm and all of the meaning of chestnuts roasting on an open fire. If the whole world just generally resembled the little fantasy kingdoms in the mall, and that most of us try to approximate in our front yards each December, then the world would not need saving and God would not have needed to go to the bloody lengths he did to make that salvation a reality. We celebrate and look for the second coming of Jesus because we believe in his first coming. Now, Jesus in this text, in Mark, uses apocalyptic language. Language, actually, that the scriptures often use in order to point to and to signal God's mighty acts in history. And so you see, when Jesus says that the sun will be darkened here in our text, that the moon will not give its light, that stars will fall from the sky, he is not talking literally about the moon, about the sun and the moon and the stars. He's talking about God's mighty action, his intervention in human history. He's not talking about astrophysics here. Now we actually see an example of this over in Acts, the second chapter. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, enters into human history and gives birth to the church. And he displays his power by enabling the disciples to declare the wonders of God 
in the tongues and in the languages of the people present from all different parts of the earth. It is a mighty act of God intervening in human history. But it is described with apocalyptic language. Let me pick up the account in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 7. So here are, the, uh, here are the, um, the, the people that have heard the apostles speaking in all of these different languages. And we read, let me start in verse, verse 7. Utterly amazed, all of these people, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all the parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great day and glorious day of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, there weren't wonders in the heavens above and on the earth below on the day of Pentecost. The sun didn't go dark. The moon didn't turn to blood. There wasn't blood and fire and smoke. What there was was a mighty advent of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And that coming of the Spirit is described in this phenomenological language, this, uh, uh, this apocalyptic, apocalyptic language. I'm coming back, says Jesus. Stars will fall from the sky. Watch. Now this brings me to the second thing that I want to observe, and that is how to watch. Well, we watch by working in the certainty of his coming. Listen again to Mark, uh, the, to Jesus in Mark 32, 13, 32 through 36. There, Jesus says, No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servant in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everything. So Jesus uses this imagery. He says, well, it's like, a, like someone who owns a home. And he goes away and he leaves all of his servants uh, with work. And he gives them specific tasks. And then Jesus says at the end, what I say to you, I say to all. And we all have tasks to do. We have all been given spiritual gifts. We have been given natural talents. We all have callings in this life. Those callings may be within the church or they may be without. As Martin Luther famously said, the calling of the priest is no more sacred than that of the milkmaid. In an article last year, Dan Doriani, who is a professor at Covenant Seminary, uh, was writing about Martin Luther. And he wrote, Martin Luther probably did more than any Protestant to establish the theology of work many Christians embrace today. Like no theologian before him, he insisted on the dignity and value of all labor. Luther did did more than break the split between sacred and secular work. He empowered all believers to know their work served humanity and enjoyed God's full blessing. He insisted that the farmer shoveling manure And the maid milking her cow please God as much as the minister preaching or praying. 
Further, as we work in God in our God-given station in life, we become agents of his providential care. God is milking the cows through the vocation of the milkmaid. Through our hands, God answers the prayers of his children. We pray daily for bread at night, and bakers rise in the morning and bake it. The same holds for clothing. God gives the wool, but not without our labor. If it is on the sheep, it makes no garment. Humans must shear, card, and spin. Through our work, the naked are clothed, the hungry are fed, the sick healed. Through our work, we please our maker, and we love our neighbor. Jesus isn't talking about some kind of specialized work in the church. He's just saying that we all have tasks. We all have callings in life. And whatever that calling may be, we are called to do so with the realization that we are working for God. And we do our work, we carry out our calling in the expectation that Jesus is coming back. And we work with that in mind. We work with our eye towards his return. And we watch. Now the text here in Mark, at the end of this, just simply goes on to the next event uh, in Christ's life. But in Matthew's account, which I've noted in 24, which is the parallel passage to this one, Jesus actually goes on from here before he goes to that next, next event. And what immediately follows in Matthew's gospel is the parables of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now, we don't have time to go there, but if you are familiar with those texts, you know that they, are, they all have to do with being ready to give an account for whatever has been entrusted to us. The call of Jesus to watch is a wonderful reminder, actually, that we are, we are able to serve him throughout our, our lives. And that, as Jesus says elsewhere, we can lay up treasure in heaven, that reward awaits for faithful service, no matter how menial or insignificant it may appear in the eyes of the world. But it is also a warning not to squander God's gifts in this life by living to serve ourselves rather than Christ. And so on this first Sunday in Advent, as we prepare for Christmas, let us look in faith to Jesus who I came as a baby born to the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. To Jesus who will come again in great glory. And let's live each day of our lives before him as we watch for his return. Stars will fall from the sky. Watch. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for the great and glorious hope that we have of the advent of our, of our Lord. And we look forward to that day when he will come and when he will renew all things, when all will be made right. And so, Lord, as we prepare to celebrate that first coming of Jesus, may we also keep ever in mind that great, wonderful, and eternal work that he has done that will be brought to fruition and completion at his second coming. We pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.